it's okay. So we're gonna okay, we're gonna start. Hi, everyone. My name is Kat Romano, and I'm the Programming and Human Rights Coordinator at the Montreal Holocaust Museum. I want to welcome you all to our event, All Jews Out, a virtual screening and discussion. Today, the esteemed filmmaker Emmanuel Run will be in conversation with Pro Professor Brad Prager, during which we'll learn about the Oscar-nominated documentary, All Jews Out, which has been praised for its rare archival footage and its bold examination of human cruelty and resilience. We're grateful to our partners on this event, the Goethe Institute of Montreal and the Semaine d'Action contre le Racisme, whose programming is currently running for the next week. At the Montreal Holocaust Museum, we aim to educate people of all ages and backgrounds about the Holocaust while sensitizing the public to the universal perils of anti-Semitism, racism, hate, and indifference. Through, through our commemorative programs and educational initiatives, the museum promotes respect for diversity and the sanctity of human life. Before we begin, I wanna go over a bit of housekeeping. Um, everyone will be kept on mute during the event and the conversation between Emmanuel and Brad will be followed by a Q and A. Um, and everyone can ask uh, questions in writing in the chat. Um, if you think of questions during the discussion, feel free to write them in as you think of them and uh, we'll be monitoring the chat throughout. If you have any technical difficulties, um, message me directly and I'll do my best to help you out. Um, so now I would like to introduce Abigail Hirsch, who brought us the idea for this um, event. Abigail, originally from post-war Hungary and raised in Montreal, is a multifaceted individual known for her roles as a film producer, director, blogger, and the founder of Ask Abigail Productions. She graduated with a bachelor's in Jewish history and English li literature from Hebrew University in Jerusalem. She later earned a master's in social work from Yeshiva University in New York City. Her work focuses on the Shoah and its impact, as well as Jewish awareness and advocacy. Her first documentary, Yiddish, A Tale of Survival, explores the world of Yiddish theater and its significance both in Montreal and the rest of the world. Now I'm going to pass the mic over to Abigail to introduce our speakers. Thank you for that lovely introduction. And I would like to express my sincere gratitude to Daniel Amar, the executive director of the Holocaust Museum, and to Kat Romanow, programming director of, and of um, programming director and human rights director at the Holocaust Museum. Um, I I had the pleasure of meeting um Emmanuel Rund in Jerusalem when I was there a year ago. And today I have the honor of introducing him to you. Summarizing the life and career of someone as exceptional as Emmanuel is challenging, but I will try to do both as his life story and his career are so closely tied to his unwavering passion for filmmaking and human rights advocacy. Emmanuel journey began in Jerusalem during the British mandate, where he was born to German refugee parents. From sneaking out of high school to witness the Eichmann trial as a teenager to serving in the Six Day War in Jerusalem, his experiences have profoundly shaped his perspective. Following his military service, he co-founded Israel's first television channel, TV One, where he had the opportunity to meet and document the lives of numerous Israeli leaders. His journey led him to the United States, where he continued his work in television and film, producing and directing an impressive array of 240 movies and TV shows. His focus eventually shifted towards documenting the Shoah, resulting in over 40 impactful films, many of which were produced during his 20 year residency in Germany. Interviewing Emmanuel Run today is Brad Prager, a renowned scholar of film, of German cinema and literature. He holds the Catherine P. 
Payne Middlebush Chair of Humanities at the University of Missouri, with additional affiliations at Stanford University and the Washington Holocaust Museum. Brad Prager has spent many years researching various aspects of film history, contemporary German cinema, and Holocaust film and literature. He's also the author of several essential books on these topics. Today, we are honored to have these two giants with us. Brad Prager will interview Emanuel Rund and deeply delve into his life and work. Get ready to be inspired. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, so Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you. I, I too should uh, very much thank uh, Abigail for the lovely introduction and thank Kat and the, uh, of course, the Montreal Holocaust Museum for organizing this event. Um, it's a terrific opportunity for me because it's something that fascinates me in terms of my research, all the work I've done. I'm very interested in not only survivor testimony, of course, something that's interesting to all of us, um, but then also hearing from perpetrators and bystanders, uh, especially German voices about their experience from that time. So I was very, I very much welcomed the opportunity to talk to Emmanuel as we're doing today. I'm really glad about it. I'm glad to uh, get to dive deeper into this fascinating film. I think, Emmanuel, if you don't mind, just to help us get our footing, to help us uh, orient ourselves, so to speak, if you could say a few words maybe about how you came to make this film, All Jews Out, uh, how did the ideas come about, how was the development of the project, and so on. Um, we'd love to hear that. Yeah, thank you very much for everybody for arranging it all. And uh, today we have a special historical day. We deal with the Holocaust. But today we had the fast of uh, Queen Esther, who was able to avoid the killing of Jews in the in uh, Persia in Iran today, in 127 states over there. And since 3,000 years, we commemorate that uh, miracle, this nest that she and her uncle Mordechai were able. And these days, unfortunately, also in Canada, I guess that uh, there's so much anti-Semitism and graffiti and attacks. And so my series of uh, 40 films were from Shoah Lit Kuma, from the Holocaust to the revival of Israel. And uh, this is exactly what we are. So to your question, first of all, thank you, Brad, for appearing here with me. And uh, I appreciate it. And uh, I, I'll go back a little bit, 1980, I was in Hollywood with Israeli friends and we cranked uh, features, movies. And after a few movies, one morning after med I meditated, I uh, decided I didn't come to this world to entertain the world. I have to do more meaningful things. As I've done earlier, I've done 50 films to improve bedside manner in America and other projects for the American government. And uh, so I decided I'm the only Meshuga, only crazy guy who lives beautiful life in Hollywood and uh, left Hollywood to the Upper West Side in New York, where I went to many synagogues and yeshivas and shuls. And I asked the rabbis or the people over there, I'm looking for survivors because I wanted to help the survivors open up and tell their story that they didn't tell until then, 1980. 35 years after the end of the Shoah, and they still kept their stories for themselves and had psychological problems. So I managed to meet throughout the, a year or so, close to 600 survivors, and uh, heard all those stories that today I'm, so to say, the witness of the eyewitnesses. I can tell their stories from different states, different countries, and I decided by that time I made about 180 films and TV shows that I will make from now on only films about the Holocaust with survivors and everything. So I started to interview uh, those uh, survivors that I met. And together with other friends, we made two films with Professor Elie Wiesel, uh, who was in Buchenwald, an Auschwitz survivor, 
uh, very famous for him, his many books. So we made two films with him. Then 1985, I went to Germany first time to make my first film in Germany uh, to a town <clears throat> called Leer Ostfriesland, L-E-E-R, Ostfriesia, uh, near the Dutch border in the North Sea, and where the town, especially Pastor Gronewald and the mayor invited Jews who used to live there, used to be part of that town from all over the world, about 20 different countries. And they came and I decided I'm going to make a film about it. It was my hardest film because usually for a film I can research. In that film I, have, I had no idea what will happen when Jews, survivors, coming after uh, 50 years to their hometown and uh, having to meet some old friends or uh, classmates that they don't know if they were Nazis or not. But I organized two camera teams and I ran it and uh, the film was uh, screened then by the Goethe Institute all over Israel and the United States in all Goethe. And uh, so that was 1985. I kept uh, helping the survivors in New York and I decided that I would like to make a film about German Jews uh, where my family came from. Uh, also with the idea that they were in concentration camp Theresienstadt, maybe theoretically they met my grandparents over there before they were sent to Auschwitz. And so I decided on family Auerbacher from Queens, New York. I started to film already in New York where their father was still alive uh, and with the old mother of Inge Auerbacher. And I uh, collected already the... Uh, material about their story. Then I decided that in 1988, for the 50 years commemoration of the pogrom night, so-called Kristallnacht, on the 9th of November 38, on that day to start filming in the hometown in Göppingen of the family Auerbacher, and uh, also organized where family Rohrbacher and uh, the son of the late uh, rabbi and other people also came from that commemoration and I started to film that film and I filmed in that town and then later on I filmed also in concentration camp Theresienstadt where the family were from 1942 to 1945 and thank God survived so that was how I started to make the film. You are mute. My apologies. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you. That's such a, a fascinating story that involves so many different um, countries and so many travels. And your intellectual curiosity is really a part of it, your personal curiosity as well. I'm wondering um, if you think about, if you think back to the reception of the film a little bit. Um, at the time, I mean, obviously it came out, how did the Germans react? I mean, there are elements of this that Germans may have been surprised to see. Yeah, that's also why I took uh, high school youngsters to do the interviews instead of me, uh, so they could learn about it, first of all. But through them, all uh, young uh, people in Germany and other people uh, would learn about what happened in Germany and the what happened after my film was screened, in many cities, they decided, first of all, to invite their Jews to their town and to research, also in the schools and youngsters, to research what happened on my street back then in, at the Nazi time. And um, so that was the beginning. And then my film uh, was invited to, to get nominated for the Oscars. And so uh, the film traveled to many, many film festivals, of course, in Germany. So it was at the Munich Film Festival International, at the Berlinale, the Berlin. And of course, with lots of press on television, media, newspaper, radio, everybody in Germany heard about the film. And whenever I screened the film in their town, in the movie theater, uh, many people came. Mm -hmm. um you mentioned the uh the students 
that you involved, which is one of the most fascinating elements for me, that oftentimes you let the students ask the questions. And when we think about some of these interview films, it's usually the filmmaker who gets in there and says, you know, I'm going to ask all of these questions, but you let the students pose the questions. And I'm wondering, first of all, what gave you that idea and how that functioned, but then also if there were other films that you were looking at at the time that maybe contributed to your process. Yeah, I've seen many films, of course, and many German films already in New York uh, with uh, Herzog and Fassbinder, but uh, I had enough uh, input of my own since uh, already at the age of 15 in Jerusalem, I was a professional photographer besides school and then starting the Israeli television. So I had enough experience and I knew what I want to do. And the reason that I took the youngsters is also that, uh, yeah, that they will bring the word uh, to other people in Germany. Also, that they themselves will discover, since I brought to the panel two ex or old Nazis, uh, for them to know that they have a neighbor who was a Nazi, and obviously they didn't know about it, and to realize that there must have been lots of Nazis in their neighborhood, in their cities. And uh, so that was also the, the idea uh, that uh, to work with the students. Also, in my first film in Germany, Lehr bis wann, Lehr until when, in 1985, I, I brought survivors to the schools, local schools, and they asked questions. What do they know about what happened in their own town? No, no word, quite. Uh, do they know who the Jews are? No word, nothing, nada. They didn't have any answer. And I decided that I have to teach the young German generation, and this will be through those high school kids locally. This is so interesting to me that in your answer, you emphasize what the students are getting out of it. I'm wondering if you feel that the, um, I mean, you referred to them as old Nazis, but the the men who see themselves as bystanders or perpetrators to different degrees, if you felt that their answers changed because of who was interviewing them, if you would have gotten a different response if it had been you in the chair saying, what did you do at that time? Yeah, when I found Mr. Bertzele, who appears in the film with a beard, the guy with a beard, uh, he tried to tell different stories and the 17 year old high school kid a son of a of a churchman uh, was able to put him down on the spot and tell him, how can you tell me that it happened on a crystal knock with the synagogue, that, that, that? And then the old man said, no, I'll tell you it some other way. We see that he tried to lie and got caught in the lie. And so uh, besides, when I came to visit him, uh, at his apartment to interview him first before I bring him to the high school kids. Uh, there was a Jewish menorah, you know, in the living room and a book of the Israeli Ephraim Kishon. So I try realize he's trying to... Now, this man was the head of the NSDAP, the Nazi party of Göppingen. So he was responsible for deportations. He was deportation for Aryanization, taking all the Jewish homes and property and money and everything. So he was not a, a, a good guy, you know. But then again, we get the feeling that uh, the 17-year-old the son of a pastor is able. I told the youngsters when I met with him to do some homework to prepare themselves before I start filming them. And that helped, like in that case of this 17-year-old man. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that comes across very clearly. They're very well prepared for the interviews and they ask questions that are on target. One thing that I find that's interesting about, I mean, the scene that you refer to where there's the lie, it's a little bit more of a gray area. He's telling a story that's comfortable for him. Well, we were not quite on the on the place where the, you know, where the synagogue was. And that's been a more comfortable memory rather than an out and out 
falsehood. It's just something that he can tell comfortably. And I think that's an interesting subtlety. And maybe that would have been different if he had felt this is the Jewish child of survivors or the Jewish child of victims that's on that's behind the camera. So very interesting technique. Um, were you did you were you looking at other Holocaust films? I mean, because at the time you were doing this, not many directors were. And so it's a revolutionary, not just the technique, but also the content. What were you, what other, how did you see the context in which the film appeared in terms of other Holocaust films and other documentaries? Well, then again, I, uh, of course, I uh, was asked to work on a number of uh, film directors on Shoah, uh, but I was busy making my own films. And, uh, so I didn't have to look around and I was thinking about how I want to do it and what my target audience, first of all, the Germans and generally speaking, but especially the young Germans. And uh, that's how I built it up. And uh, yeah, it well was nominated to the Oscar. So I guess I did a good job on it. And uh, yeah, so it was uh, what I do in all of my films, especially about the Shoah, I lived in Munich and that's where I worked. And uh, when I was cutting, I was producer, director, cameraman, editor of my films, most of my films. And uh, when I was editing my films in my edit room, I used to invite people that I just met in the movie theater or somewhere, I didn't know them. And I told them I'm looking for people to come and watch my my cut, my film cut at a certain phase. And uh, just people who have no, no professional with film or with a theme, just people, so to say, like you and me. And uh, Sunday afternoon, I would screen my cut that I started cutting. The film was like 50 hours. Then I cut it down to 10 hours. Then two hours when I was at that phase, I invited the people to sit down and have some coffee and enjoy watching the the rough cut and uh, get some input. Sometimes I got good input for them. One of them, even <laughs> a lady that I met in a movie theater came and she brought another lady. And that second lady was the secretary of Hitler. <laughs> And that was interesting, her input, <laughs> uh, what uh, she could say about my films. And uh, yeah, so that's how I did it, just to make sure that I'm getting the right product, the right film, and it worked. Mm -hmm. um, this, I'm wondering, you know, sometimes documentarians, or, you know, at that time, it started this idea of let's bring back the person to the place where it happened and different memories emerge. And it was probably one thing to get Inga Auerbacher to go back to Germany. Maybe she had been before or so on. But you bring her all the way back to Theresienstadt. And I'm wondering how she felt. Did she need to be convinced to do this? Uh, who's, was it you, entirely your idea? How did, that, how did that process go? Was there hesitation? No, she was willing to come to the to see also the Dresdner building that where she was during the war uh, under the roof for a long time. And uh, I brought her with me and I was cautious all the time to watch out that nothing happens to her because I was afraid that psychologically after so many years back in the conservation camp, something could happen to her, but everything was fine. Besides, I made with her uh, three films I made uh, All Jews Out, and I made also Inga and the Yellow Star, and also a film I'm a Star. And for that film, I decided to make uh, a, a women's film, two women's film, where Inga is telling her story to a supposedly old girlfriend from the town, from her time back then. So I was able to get Frederica, a high school kid, 12 or 13 year old, course with permission from the school and her parents and I took her also with us and I have to be careful to watch for Frederica that she doesn't get berserk and everything worked out I cooled them down and everything was fantastic no problem and it was not easy it was winter snow the the 
it was Czechoslovakia, communist Czechoslovakia, and the government sent some secret service agents to watch us, supposedly as a film team. <laughs> they didn't know anything about cameras. And so I had to be not only the director and uh, cameraman, I was also the the assistant cameraman, my own assistant cameraman, and watching for the two ladies especially. And so everything worked out. Of course, you, Inge was very excited over there, but she was very positive. She's able to tell her story. Yeah, that's um something that people should bear in mind watching the film, that it's 1991, that you're going back actually before the end of the Cold War, that this is a place where people, the West Westerners had not usually filmed before, and that changes things. Right, right. And I mean, I think the film is very important, uh, not only in terms of the content that you get, and I'm thinking about not only Inga Auerbacher talking about the Dresden barracks, and this is important testimony that people know, but also the secretary. I mean, I don't know that her testimony is anywhere else, and that's very important information. So on the one hand, we get a lot of new information, and on the other hand, I think it's very important in the history of documentary film, where when you put them in that position, and I think you know now sometimes we call this a return documentary, but where you put them in the position to say, okay, tell the story from here. And one of the moments I like from that is where she is telling the story about the star and how she would wear it and face away. And we right. can see that she reenacts it with her body on the train. And right. I think it's, it's such a, an amazing way of getting testimony to say, can you sit and can you do this again? And even, I'm sure, I don't know, I would want to know, did you give her direction? I'm, I doubt you did. But no, not turn... on that. No, she was free to do what she wants and uh, 90% was fine. And in that case was a beautiful scene, yes, that she mm -hmm. thought about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really quite remarkable. Um, I had a, a couple of other questions. One includes, I know that you still have very much to do with Germany. Um, and I'm wondering how you feel that from the time that you made the film and it was widely received to today, how you feel that memory culture has changed in Germany, how they remember the past and how they talk about it. Yeah, since once I screened my film in movie theaters, in uh, church communities, in schools, universities, uh, many people took a few steps ahead and did their own projects whatever, in their town or even in film way. Uh, when my film was in Oscar and the German filmmakers learned about it, and I influenced Spielberg to make the Schindler's List, and then many of the German filmmakers said, oh, that's a good idea to make a film about the Holocaust. Emmanuel got to the Oscars and Spielberg got, so we'll get to the Oscars well. Although I suffered lots of anti-Semitism because of that... Uh, jealousy that like one German filmmaker told me, Manuel, you have to explain. I made 40 films in Germany. I was born here. I made 40 films. You come from New York and your second film goes to the Oscars. Can you explain? Of course, they thought that here the Jews are helping the other Jew. I told him, listen, uh, Peter, I, uh, they didn't invite me. They invited my film because it's so good. And I got him and I told him, Peter, if one day you'll make one good film, it will be also invited to the Oscars. And But uh, because of jealousy, I suffered a lot also from filmmakers and TV uh, editors who sometimes were, I would say, anti-Semitic. Uh, and they gave me hard times where a film of mine uh, would be screened on Arte to 54 countries all over Europe. Uh, and the commissioning editor told me it's a hobby film. You didn't make what we did. And uh, and then I told her I was professor for films at New York University, Columbia School of Visual Arts. I was in the Oscar. I made 240 films and TV shows. I'm not a hobby film, filming like the grandmother to her grandchildren. Uh, but then again, I suffered a lot, uh, but I was getting help all the time from up there to continue and do the things. And uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. The, um, I've, this tradition continues, I think, where the 
idea of saying, well, it's not a serious topic or it's not a legitimate topic. And that's often a way in which people dismiss it or set it aside. But fortunately, there are other institutions that say this is important work. So I'm glad about that. Um, one of the themes that comes up in the film, to return to the film itself, um, one of the themes that comes up very well or comes across very well, I think, is this idea of, we would say in English, expropriation. But the fact that you take the property of the Jews of the city of Göppingen, and I mean, the first thing was to say, you cannot own gold or silver or platinum, right? I mean, right. That it's, you know, that in a way, it, it improves the economy of the local economy if you expropriate or take everything from the Jews. And so one question that uh, already was, was sent into Kat was whether you interviewed people who lived in formerly Jewish homes or whether you spoke to anyone in Göppingen who was now living in a place where Jews had lived before and whether they felt any responsibility about that. Did that come up as you were working on the film? Well, I heard from Inge, actually, that she went to the house where she used to live and uh, that uh, she brought with her a bottle of wine for the people and they were very friendly. And so that was nice. But of course, there are many Germans who don't open the door for Jews who come. They're afraid they want to take back their property. And so, yeah. And by the way, about the uh, changes in Germany, so once I made this film, later on I made uh, the film uh, uh, Begegnungen in Israel, in uh, Encounters in Israel, where I took from the first town, Leos Friesland, where I made my first film, I took a group of young Germans, I took them to Israel to meet the Jews of their town who lived in Israel, like about 20 immigrants, and then to meet also their second generation children and to meet the third generation, grandchildren, altogether 120 people who whose roots are in that town where these youngsters live. And uh, I made the film, and uh, in one of the events, I didn't want to put Holocaust on them. I just wanted friendly. They can hug survivors, and they can do whatever they want, go to the kibbutzim, religious, and, and others. And... Uh, then they told me that it was 1994 that they would look, like to go to Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Memorial Center in the world in Jerusalem, the next day when it was Yom HaShoah, the Holocaust Memorial Day in April 1994. And of course, I was glad that they wanted to go without having me to ask them. And I filmed the two hours of ceremony. They were very brave because it wasn't easy in 1994 to stand and hear all the survivors and the event and at the Holocaust Memorial Center of the world. At the end, one of them, Karen, came to me and said on camera, I'm a, in German, of course, shouted it, that all the 300 survivors in the area heard. She said, I'm ashamed that in my country, in Germany, we don't have a day to remember the victims the way you, the Jews, do. And that was on my to-do list because Germany until then didn't have a memorial day to the Holocaust. And since I was in Germany, besides film, I served also as a rabbi cantor in 15 Jewish communities on Sabbath and holidays, Jewish holidays. And I uh, was also elected to be on the Christian Jewish Relations Board. There are six people, Protestants, uh, Catholics, and two Jews, and I was one of them. And so I was invited very often uh, to events where the top VIPs, the chancellor, presidents, people, top people of the church and education were there. And when I came back after the filming of, I made six films with that group in Israel, and when I came back to Munich to edit the film and I was invited to those events, I decided this is a time to tell the Germans you have to have a memorial day to the Holocaust. So from the middle of 94 till the end of 95, <clears throat> I spoke to about 250 Germans, asking them to help me bring the idea up to the German president. And on 3rd of January, 1996, after a year and a half of hard work, I heard from the office of German president, 
a Roman Herzog, that he is taking my initiative and is proclaiming the Holocaust Memorial Day for Germany, but as I ask a Memorial Day to the Holocaust and to all the victims of the Nazis, not only the Jews. And he declared the 27th of January, 1996 to be the Memorial Day. And then many countries all over the world adopted my day, so to say, for their Memorial Day, first time in, to the Holocaust. Uh, later on, it was brought by the Israeli ambassador to the UN, to the UN uh, uh, secretary, Mr. Kofi Annan, uh, and he declared 2005 the International Holocaust Amendment Day. Since that day, to answer your question, many Germans picked up that idea and they started also January 27 initiatives, many church groups. They started to, to do the March of Living in many towns. And so it became very, so to say, fruitful, I would say, the memorial process in Germany, kind of a revolution. Mm -hmm. Well, this, I mean, it goes back to an originary moment, which is, I mean, when your film came out was very close to the time, <clears throat> as you say, Schindler's List came out not long after, and the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum also opened in the early 90s. And many people even use the phrase in the United States, this was the year of the Holocaust, they say 1993 right. or so. Right. And uh, the so even if Germany adopted a Holocaust Remembrance Day and so on, it makes sense to me that it would start in the mid 90s. But a lot of time has passed since then. I mean, I know for some people, myself included, it feels like yesterday if we say, oh, 2005 or so. But so much has changed both in Germany and in Israel. And I'm wondering about a couple of things. I mean, whether if you would make the film, if it would be similar today, and then if the students that you talk to, would they be similar today to the ones who, if you went to find German students 20 years old, and said, I want you to be involved in my project, what would your expectations be? Yeah, I think the students, I'll find students to do it, uh, who would be even glad to do it. And it would be easier for them because they are one generation further away from their grandparents, uh, so to say, the Nazis. And so I don't think there'll be a problem. The only thing is that since uh, throughout the years, anti-Semitism is on the rise, especially since the 7th of October, 2023, uh, <clears throat> including in Canada, including many countries. And uh, so now it's a different ball game. Also, for me to go and lecture in different places, they'll have to get guards to guard me even. When, because like today in Canada, at the Toronto Film Festival, there were many attacks against the place with graffiti and everything. And so the people who run those things have to be protected. And then we are coming back to Germany of the 30s, God forbid. But people have to learn about it and to learn from the past. So things don't happen, but we see this thing started to happen. And we, the world has to stop it. Well, not only Israel and not only the Jews. Because we say that once it happens to the Jews, it happens to other people as well. Uh, Hitler killed 6 million Jews and 50 million people all over Europe. So it was, you know, God forbid that something happens to the Jews today, then it happens to other people. So they have to get organized and to get all the negative negativity of those uh, attackers. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you know, we when we look at a Holocaust film, we often try to make try to draw a connection or take lessons from today. If you were making a film like this today, or if you were making this film today, would you make those connections clearer than you did in 91? Or would you still leave it to say, I want the viewer to understand the connections to their own culture and responsibility? Say it again. If you were making the film, if you were making the film today, I mean, you say it's very right. important we think about anti-Semitism and that we think about the world we live in. Would you make the connections clear or would you also say, talking about the past, the viewer should make the connection for themselves? Yeah, since all of my films, I use them 
to to do something, to create something, to teach something, to move something. So of course I'll use such a film today. Uh, I'll do it uh, <clears throat> uh, in order to stop all that anti-Semitism, or at least to reduce it in so many countries. And uh, one film that I'm planning to do is about my grandfather, Max Emanuel Wund in Berlin. He came with his five brothers from Poland with a suitcase and to Berlin. And he got a good job uh, as a tailor and uh, factories to, to, for clothing and a boutique for clothing in Berlin to the who and who. And he became a millionaire very fast. He even got a job from the German military in First World War to sew all the uniforms for the German army, he became a millionaire. And But he and his five brothers, each one had a factory or whatever, they, besides donating to the Jewish community and to other social causes, they donated money, they organized uh, soup kitchens in Berlin for the poor Germans, non-Jews. And my grandfather spent money to print a newspaper for the poor Berliners who couldn't spend afford the newspaper or radio and wanted to know the news. So once a week, they went to pick up at Alexanderplatz to pick up my grandfather's trucks of newspapers. And uh, so my idea is that Jews throughout the centuries uh, always made sure that they'll be safe by the people within they lived in. Because there were many pogroms and there were inquisition. There were Jews were every 50 years, 100 years, 200 years. Jews were massacred uh, in one or another country. And so Jews tried always to, to bribe the rulers, you know, here I give you gold, I give you this, just don't kill me. So sometimes they took the gold and killed them anyhow. But often it was a milking cow. Why shall I kill him? He's bringing me every year, he bringing me presents. So Jews were able to live. And that's a mentality that until today, but that's a long story I don't want to get to. But I thought about it, that I wanted to take the point of Jews who, who uh, donated in their town to them to build a museum and the hospital and the school and for minorities. But then in my case of my grandfather in 1936, the Nazis wanted all of his property and buildings. And of course, he didn't want to give it. And uh, they tortured him, the Gestapo, and killed him. So this is a message for Jews maybe around the world. It's nice that you donate for all those causes. But you have to know that, God forbid, someday the people, unfortunately, will turn against you or on you. And so that's one of my next films uh, to be made. Uh, that sounds fascinating. I'm looking forward to that. Um, I'm enjoying keeping you all to myself here, but I'd like to open it up that if other people have questions uh, that we can share your experience here. So I'm going to keep keep an eye on um, keep an eye on that for the for the time being. If people have questions, you can go ahead and uh, write those in. One question. I mean, just while we wait for people to come in. I was surprised in the film. There's a moment when I think you call him as the uh, the the commander of the fire brigade, the bearded man. Right. And he says, and it's a word that you've used already, but he said shame. And he said, I was ashamed that I didn't realize what was going on. Okay. And I was thinking about as a filmmaker, or as somebody who takes testimony from the Holocaust, where you see that as an important emotion or sentiment, I mean, to either make someone feel shame or to make them realize that they themselves experience shame. Where does that, uh, how important do you see that in coming to terms with or understanding guilt? Well, uh, since my work is also against genocides all over the world, and I work with different groups, uh, Native Americans, many others, and I was invited by the ladies who started the Biafra uh, Museum uh, of their Holocaust, and uh, not Holocaust, but their genocide. And uh, 
Yeah, so I want also my films to tell people don't do anything bad against your neighbor or against somebody else because later on you might regret it. So think about it before you do anything like what the Nazis do did. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. It reminded me very much of the moment at the end of this uh, famous film now, the interview with Hitler's secretary, which is called Blind Spot or Im Totenwinkel. And she's talking about the um, uh, the sis the uh, the brother and sister Scholl, Sophie Scholl. Right. And she says, you know, I walk by the plaza that is dedicated to the Scholl siblings, and I think maybe I could have known more. Right. And it's this little glimpse of there's I I I'm not entirely personally responsible, but I could have done more, and that's an important ray of light. Right. I think. Well, uh, as I said, she came to my room, editing room, to watch my film about Israeli artist Danny Caravan. Mm -hmm. uh, and we had a long talk, of course, and I thought immediately to make a film about her, but I was busy with other films, and I thought I had enough, I had done enough, let others do it. Uh, but uh, what was the second part of your... Well, I just I thought found it to be parallel with the uh, chief of the fire brigade, where somebody acknowledge they can't say I did something really bad, but maybe I could have known more, and this embarrasses me. Yeah, and then again, for people to know, don't do anything bad because there might come the day that you regret it. And uh, yeah, um, do you get asked more and more? I mean, you talked about uh, talking about Cambodia and other things. Do you, are you getting asked more and more to think comparatively about the Holocaust in relationship to other? Uh, genocides or other acts of violence? Yeah, like when my film was screened at the uh, Munich International Film Festival, they threw a party for me. And during the party came to me five big men and one of them, like a bear, fell on my shoulders and started crying. And he said, Emmanuel, I'm so glad to see how you do things for your people and for other people. He was a Native American, an Indian American. And he asked me to help them with their causes. So that was a nice uh, nice um, possibility to help somebody. Besides, uh, my mother's grandfather's uh, uncle and his brother left Kassel, Germany in, in 1820. And they came to America and they helped the Native Americans in writing the, the Indian Nation Charter and helped them, and both of them married the princesses. So until today, I have in America family Dannenberg. They kept the German-Jewish name, and I have many relatives who are Native Americans, German Jews. <laughs> it's nice. Yes, there's so many points of intersection, I think. It's fascinating. Um, there are a couple questions return money to you. Um, the uh, one other Another question that came in, this is again from Ray, who asks, and I realize I forgot to ask about it, the archival films that you use in um, in All, All Jews Out. Can you say, just give us a little bit of a sense of where where you found those and did they all come from a single source and how you came to use those? Okay, thank you, Ray. First, I'll answer that I have an archive of almost 50 years of film materials and photos, 40,000 photos, documents, all of my films, the raw footage of my films, and I'm looking now for a possibility to get an institution to take my archive because everything about those themes is in there and they could would be able to show it, present it to the people who would like to research about the Holocaust, about German Jews, about European Jews. And But as far as raise the direct question, yeah, I uh, collected, I was searching for footage. Some of it came from the Rohbacher Dent family who came from that town and moved to the United States. Like the man with his little daughter walk on the street uh, with her and in the background there's the swastika or lighting Hanukkah candles uh, or walking with the rabbi on Sunday afternoon in, in the forest. Uh, this came from that uh, family. And then I went to archive in Stuttgart, in the state of Baden-Württemberg, 
uh, and collected over their material. Of course, there was some material from Ingrid's family. And uh, yeah, I searched for the different German archives, you know, whatever, because just uh, in my style of films, I don't like talking heads. I I let somebody sit, talk. I filmed him or her talking, but then I cut into footage or something that can show something else uh, and, and, and educate about the location, about what were the people like back then and give the impression of, uh, yeah, so I use uh, in all of my films, I use lots of uh, uh, archival material. Mm -hmm. And now I have my own archive, so. <laughs> <laughs> the um yeah, it's really important to go back and look at that footage and see what we find it's a shame to hear you say that you don't like the talking heads because you're really good at bringing out and especially not just with the students but letting inga auerbacher be herself and letting her share i think that's one of the strengths of the film i wanted to mention since i for just what i bring to the table but there are a couple of other films that I thought of that if people are interested in where, you know, they go back to archives and look at those anew. I mean, one that I think of is this one uh, by Darius Yablonski, perhaps you know it, called Photographer or, or or Amateur Photographer, depending on the title. I think the Polish, the Polish title is Photo Amateur. Um, but it's, he takes photographs of the Lodz ghetto in color and really surveys those and says, let's remember the perpetrators took them and intercuts it with a contemporary doctor in the Lodz ghetto. Absolute fascinating film if you like to think about those original documents. The other one that comes to mind, very similar to the Blind Spot film, is this one called A German Life, which was interviews with uh, the secretary of Goebbels and she was 104 years old when they did the interviews, very recent. She, she died not long after. But they do something that's similar to what you do, which is they bring in that archival footage in between that hopefully we see with different eyes when we look at it. But those would be two that I would say if people are interested in that part of the film. Photographer by uh, Darius Yablonski and then A German Life was made by a team of Austrian filmmakers. <laughs> do you, you, You're nodding a little bit. Do you know one of these? Films, Emmanuel? No, not really. I was busy either making my films or screening them and lecturing. And uh, a shoemaker goes barefoot, so I don't go enough to watch those films, uh, unless it's something. But uh, since I made my films not directly only on the Shoah, but always Jewish topics, like I was asked by the second station, ZDF in Germany, 1992, to make a film to 500 years expul expulsion of Jews from Spain and the Inquisition in Spain. And since uh, my mother's family, Lopez, came from there, I made a film in Toledo and all the way up to, to Venice and then Amsterdam and Hamburg, my mother's family, and up to Lair, where they settled. And uh, yeah, so different films uh, were in different... Uh, uh, different uh, ideas, how I made them. And if I may, I'll go quickly two minutes on, on the list of films that I made. Uh, as I said, Encounters in Israel about the young Germans meeting Jews of their town. Then I made a film with those youngsters. It's called Neo-Nazi Museum in a Kibbutz. There was a survivor in a kibbutz in order to remember his brother who was killed by the Nazis, uh, he opened a small museum and the German volunteers, young volunteers, used to send him from Germany also material about neo-Nazis in Germany. So that's the only museum in the world about Nazis and neo-Nazis. And then uh, I made a film about uh, two Germans who in 1963 left uh, Baden-Württemberg near Stuttgart to come to Israel to help the Jews, to help the survivors. They say, we were not talking enough. They used to be high in the church. They came to Israel and they have children and grandchildren. Some of them converted to Judaism. And it's a very nice film. I made a film called Mazel Tov. I found someone about Marion Cohn from Frankfurt emigrated to Israel in the uh, 30s. And she decided she wants to do something special. She spent all of her free time and money 
in the 60s, 70s, 80s to go to Germany, every city, to go to the archive or to the church to write down with a pencil uh, all the names of the Jews of town, date of birth. Then she would come back to, to Tel Aviv and set it together. So she got together uh, 850,000 names or 350,000 names of German Jews from the 1600s. Then um, I made a film about the Israeli artist called Danny Caravan, who made his projects also in Berlin and all over Europe uh, for peace, first of all, but also to remember the Holocaust in many places. And he did the way of human rights in Nuremberg that was written. I filmed Mr. Stefan Hessel, who wrote at the UN in 1948, the the Charter of Human Rights, and that set up as an artwork in Nuremberg. And uh, I made a I, film. I'm, I'm going to stop you, Emmanuel, only because okay. we're just about out of time. There's uh, one quick question about. Yeah. I mean, I'm you know I'm an academic, and so I know how to get hold of these films. If if do you want to share? Is there a way that people can see a couple more of your films? Is there is the best thing to go to your website? What would you suggest? Well, the film, uh, this film, All Jews Out, people can uh, get it, order it from uh, Brandeis University Jewish Film Center, maybe for 20 bucks to get a, uh, a copy. Uh, and uh, the reason for my archive that there are some places, institutes are interested in it, especially one major one in the United States, and that will be once uh, we put it together and expose it to people, we'll do all the work of uh, post-production and putting subtitles in different languages and making it available for everybody all over the world. And that's at that stage I'm now that hopefully this institute will take it and work with me on exposing it to the world. Okay, I can't wait for that to happen. I'm looking forward to many retrospectives and DVD box sets for my own collection. Um, I'm going to pass it back to uh, Kat so that she can close us out. So thank you so much, Emmanuel. You're welcome. Thank you so much. Um, so I wanted to thank everyone for joining us today for this event, which introduced us to this important documentary and leaves us wanting to watch all of Emmanuel's film. Um, I want to thank both of you, our speakers, Emmanuel and Brad. Thank you for your insightful discussion today. And I know I learned so much, so much and I think everyone else here did as well. Um, for everyone in the audience, we'll be sending out a post-event email that will include a survey, as well as the link to Emmanuel's documentary that you'll be able to watch until uh, March 25th. So thank you again for coming and have a great day. And if thank you very much for the event. And if you can give people my website or my email address, because sometimes people have further questions, I'll be glad to answer them, anybody who writes. So well, thanks thank again, you. everybody, uh, for doing it. And I enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a great day. Till the next. <laughs>